Welcome to a video that none of you expected to show up in your feed. Now why did I pick something not from fantasy or folklore? A couple reasons, allow me to explain. Reason one is because these things make less sense than Superman's narrative success, but are somehow real. Reason two is because this is my hundredth video, and this is something that I wanted to make. And reason three is because next to axolotls, cuttlefish, and a couple others, these are my favorite animals. And reason four is because no one would sponsor this video, aside from myself. I'll explain near the end of the video, but I'm writing a bestiary for 5th edition that I'd appreciate you checking out, or following its updates in the link below. Reason five is because I have three days to make this. All right, let's look at water bears. Water bears, also known as moss piglets, tardy grades, slow steppers, or uh, are microscopic aliens that look like the Michelin man. That German word means little bear creature because Germany has the best language. Natural denizens of moisture. These tiny pudge balls are found most often in moss or aquatic environments, but also at the tops of every mountain, deep in the rainforests, hot springs, deep sea mud volcanoes, empty sand dunes, fucking lava at the bottom of deep sea trenches, the void, the plain of dreams, heaven, hell, and relier. They own this planet, and if we burn it to death or it freezes over, they will persist. Chingus Bingus the Science Dingus even thinks that if the sun blows up, they'll be perfectly fine. We put some on a tennis ball, used a chuck it to huck them into space, and most of them came back alive in a stasis. And then we put a water droplet on them and they were fine. These are just a race of micro supermen. Their unnatural durability and old sofa-like appearance gave them a rise to popularity. Even having been featured in that one Ant-Man thing, they're the most naturally persistent creatures in the known world. Extreme environments, even when switched fast enough to cause system shock, they just vibe out. Where anything else would normally die, they squeeze out moisture and take a long nap like Master Chief did during his transition from a good game to a bad one. Maybe they have some kind of cosmic plot protection? Are they really the dominant race? Yes. I actually feel like there's some kind of precursor creature designed to be a food source in unlikely areas and spark these ecosystems. They dip down into deep trenches, mass-produced by eating algae, then some weird creature thinks, hey look, a buffet. Then a couple generations later, they adapt to withstand the pressure and boom, more deep sea aliens. I could keep explaining their one interesting trait over and over, their durability even in the face of radiation, and what little we know about them, but I'm not a scientist. I'm a creative writer. So at this point, I want to explore a hypothetical. What, what, what if they were bigger? Microscopic organisms do not have a physical capacity for self-awareness, longevity, or the ability to intentionally cultivate symbiosis, which, are, which is smart guy words to say that they can only make friends by accident. So growing them, the first thing I looked at is lifespan. As it turns out, the bigger a species naturally is, the longer it lives. But if you're bigger than average, you live shorter, which is just a mutation trait. The most average guy probably lives the longest, and tall people have health problems. Also having uh, several evolutionary stages helps, but we'll get to that. So I'm going to expand their three to four month lifespan to an average medium-sized creature span of 30 to 40 years. Because it's cute, let's make them half the size of humans. And because I'm a human writer, let's give them a vocal language and the brain power of a six-year-old child, close to crows. The goal of a natural species is simply to persist. And right now, we have already created the cosmic winner. They would very quickly become a mainstay in every environment, period. Vegetation will cause them to spread, and of course, the ability to go into a literal age-defying stasis means that they can set up ancestors in desert lands and wait for global warming to change the ecosystem, and then wake up and eat something. To explain, when food sources are limited, they create a thick shell of armor that stops them from growing, and then they remove all moisture from their bodies. Doing this intentionally halts their metabolism, and a real tardigrade can live in this preserved pod for up to 10 years. Which means a big tardigrade, barring size complications, could live up to 100 years and that time does not affect their normal lifespan. That's so bone chilling, imagine these old statues like terracotta soldiers of little bear things just coming to life after we thought they were statues for a hundred years. But being in every environment and eating their fill before moving on to another non-native location, uh, this is what we call an invasive species. Being semi-aquatic, resistant to both salt water and fresh water, tropical and arctic locations, they'd be everywhere. Exploring this timeline, and a lack of resource preservation or cultivation, because they have a six-year-old brain, they'd burn out the earth even faster than we've been trying to do. 
consuming proportional vegetation. They destroy an environment, leave it, and then do it again. Anywhere and everywhere until there is no environment. So imagine, at the end of this timeline, a dead world. Invaded, depleted of resources, turned to a husk, and then all those weird things would just bury themselves and wait for the next life cycle once the water kicks back in. So anyway, there's uh, the history of Mars for you. Just add a shrink ray to that narrative and you have yourself a B-list movie. I'd say that's basically tardigrades, but it wasn't really. I just wanted to draw you in and hopefully enjoy what I enjoy. Y y you know, like my book. Stibble's Codex of Companions is a 5e supplement that focuses on pets, familiars, and some of the less dangerous, more endearing creatures you might find in your settings. I'm so happy to be able to do something like this and do it right for the first time. With over 70 creatures, some by my own design, some reimagined creatures from folklore, and animals with unique abilities, me and my team are trying to make this book enjoyable for both dungeon masters and players. We've got minis, we've got art, we've got plushies, and in the works are some companion character cards for quick reference, as well as companion sheets that you can personalize. If you want to keep up to date and then support me when it comes out, you can follow the project in the link below. And I just want to say thank you. I really appreciate all you've done for me so far. I enjoy entertaining you while secretly teaching you some random crap. Till next week.